In my book, Mysteries of Canada, Volume 2, I described an ancient necromantic rite traditionally practiced by the Innu, Cree, Ojibwe, and other First Nations across Canada, in which a medicine man attempts to contact both human and inhuman spirits for the purpose of acquiring hidden or occult knowledge. In preparation for this ritual, a tall, sturdy cylindrical tent is erected either outside or within a larger dwelling. The tent's frame typically consists of a number of stout poles, driven into the ground in a circular formation, bound together by circular hoops. Once completed, the entire structure, save for a small area at the top, is covered with skins, blankets, bark, or heavy cloth. Although the finer details of the shaking tent ritual vary from nation to nation, the procedure typically unfolds as follows. After sunset, the shaman elected to preside over the ceremony crawls into the tent, usually bearing a calumet or tobacco pipe, and a rattle or drum. Once inside, the medicine man sings and makes noise with his instrument, inviting any spirits present in the area to join him inside the tent. After some time, the tent shakes with impossible violence, as if pummeled by powerful gusts of wind rushing in through the opening in its top and swirling throughout its interior. This agitation is supposed to be occasioned by the arrival of the spirits. After the shaking dies away, the medicine man invites members of the assemblage outside the tent to ask the spirits any questions they might have, such as the fate of sick loved ones, or the whereabouts of enemies, game, or traveling friends. The standard payment for this service is traditionally a small piece of tobacco, which the supplicant often tosses into the tent through the opening in the top. Once the fee is paid, the medicine man relays the question to the spirit in a language which none of the onlookers understand. He receives an equally incomprehensible reply, uttered in an unearthly voice which often emanates from the top of the tent. The medicine man then translates the answer for the benefit of the supplicant, before asking other members of the congregation to field their own questions. Eerily, the spirit's replies and predictions are almost always later found to be true. During my research into the mystery of the shaking tent, I was unable to find any accounts of the ritual taking place in the recent past, and assumed that the practice had probably died out sometime in the 20th century. Shortly after the publication of my piece, however, several of my readers informed me that the rite was still performed from time to time on Indian reserves and reservations across Canada and the United States. One of these readers was my friend Bex Coral, who put me in touch with her own friend, a fascinating lady from Oshawa, Ontario, named Nicole Barker, who participated in a shaking tent ceremony years ago. Nicole is of Ojibwe heritage, and was adopted by another family at infancy. She attended the shaking tent ceremony in the hope that she might learn the location of her birth mother. The following is Nicole's recollection of her experience in her own words. I was involved in one. I'm 49. This happened when I was 22, I think. And it usually comes with a question, right? Every shaking tent ceremony is done the same way. And it also has its own experiences within it. So my experience will be different than other people's experience in terms of what you see and what you feel. So going back to my experience, I can talk about that. We were down at Anishinaabe Health in Toronto. And I was a part of an adoptees group. And we all were at the moment in our lives that we wanted to be able to understand possibly where we came from. The elder, the healer, that we gave the tobacco to he used our tobacco in his pipe for our question. So this tent was, it was probably uh, about five to six foot tall. I'm guessing, I'm trying to remember exactly. And you were, the gentleman was, was able to sit inside of it. It went back 
further, probably two. Like if I were to be able to sit in a seat, that would be a square around me. And it was a little bit further back, probably another foot or so. And it had the structure of a wood, a stick, and there was also cedar and other branches um, alongside and in front and above. So we were all in total darkness, but he was inside. And he was able to communicate with spirit to give us answers about our family, about my birth mother, my birth father at the time, about them, where they possibly could be, where, you know, you know I, I was wondering where they were. It, it could have been my ancestors that were talking with him. It could have been his ancestors that was uh, getting more information about my particular question. He would have to be able to answer that question. Yes, the, sh the, sh the tent shook. Yes, there was a lot of um, singing, drumming. I, I heard like a wolf, a wolf howling. Um, it, it was pretty intense. And my portion, it felt like it lost a long time. But I believe that it likely was only about 10 minutes, but it felt like it was longer. <laughs> and you just felt immersed in the, the song, your calm, and you were just in a state of total, like, this is beautiful, right? When it was done, he ended up saying to me that my birth mother was at Mount McKay. And I went, okay, <laughs> I got some place to start. <laughs> and um, I called Mount McKay. I called the uh, reserve uh, Thunder Bay, Mount McKay. And I said, I just had a shaking tent ceremony. And I was told that my birth mother is here. This is my name. Do you happen to know if there was a woman, because my adoptions say that she was 19 at the time when I was born. And I was delivered in uh, Thunder Bay Hospital. I was born on this day. Can I have more information? Do you know of anybody there that has lost a child? <laughs> um, I'm here. And the lady that was there, because usually everybody knows everybody inside the band office. Like you really know because it's your home, right? And they said, we don't, I'll get back to you, but I don't believe that we have anybody that day I know that my adoption paper said that my first name was Donna. You know, I gave them as much identifying information as I could. And then I heard that she was not there. So a couple months had passed and I was working and she called me. And she says, I'm your mom. So I stopped working. <laughs> told my boss and I went home and I told my father and my mother who raised me so upon talking with her later I said I had a shaking tent ceremony and it said that you're a Mount McKay and it was just a little bit later on and I said where are you where were you on this day at this time she said, I was at Mount McKay. <laughs> and I went, okay, so why are you not there? Because apparently you're supposed to live there. She says, no, the purpose of the shaking tent was, where is she? That was my question. And she was there. But she was there for a powwow. 
So the shake and tent ceremony was correct. As people didn't ask the question correctly, <laughs> in a way, I guess. I needed to wait that to find whether or not it was true. And it, it really was. It really was. It was it's quite magical. All of it. That whole journey. Yeah. Nicole has told me that she objects to the words necromancy and ritual being used in association with the shaking tent ceremony. The word necromancy, she wrote, is often considered to be black magic, witchcraft, sorcery. There are those who do practice these things. We as Aboriginal people do not. Our people call our communication, even in a traditional smudge, a ceremony. Shaking tent. Other ceremonies our people have participated in, like powwows, are not rituals nor necromantic practices. For example, a powwow is a celebration of giving thanks to the Creator. It's a connection to the Creator. Our ceremonies are all positive, for everyone's good. Like a shaking tent, when done, is a powerful connection with the Creator. It is not black magic or witchcraft. It's talking and giving thanks to our Creator, your Creator everyone's creator of all things on Turtle Island. Many white fur traders, travelers, and missionaries of centuries past, who witnessed the Shaking Tent Ceremony and wrote about it in their letters and memoirs, described seeing strange lights flickering around or near the top of the tent while the seance was in session. One such frontiersman was George Nelson, a fur trader who headed a succession of Hudson's Bay Company posts around Lake Winnipeg and Lac La Ronge in the early 1800s. In various letters to his father, written throughout the spring and summer of 1823, he described the mysterious lights he witnessed during Cree shaking tent ceremonies. In one of these letters, he described seeing a vast number of small lights resting on the hoops that hold the poles together during one of the rituals. In that same letter, he described the alleged experience of a Métis teenager who is said to have crawled into a shaking tent in the middle of a ceremony and paid for his curiosity. There was a dreadful fluttering within, Nelson wrote, but especially about his head, his hair flying about his face as if in a tempest, and frequent appearances of small lights before his eyes, whichever way he turned. Nelson attempted the same bold maneuver during a shaking tent ceremony held outside his post at La Ronge, and described his astonishing experience in another letter. At midnight, he wrote, the conjurer addressed me, and asked if I wished to see any of the spirits. I accepted the offer, and thrust my head underneath, and being upon my back, I looked up, and near the top observed a light, as of a star in a cloudy night, about one and a half inches long, and one broad. Though dim, yet perfectly distinct, a little after 1 a.m., one of my men looked in, with several Indians, and saw several small lights about as large as the thumbnail. A few minutes before 2 a.m., they gave another shaking to the frame and made their exit. Another description of the mysterious lights often seen during shaking tent ceremonies appears in the 1846 book The Journal of the Bishop of Montreal during a visit to the Church Missionary Society's Northwest American Mission written by Anglican Bishop George J. Mountain. In his journal, Bishop Mountain outlined the ritual as it was explained to him by two former Cree medicine men, who had long since been baptized into the Church of England. During the process going on in the Conjuring Lodge, he wrote, without boldly looking up, the conjurer catches glimpses, in the same plane with the topmost hoop of the lodge, of a number of objects like tiny stars. A similar picture is evoked by a description of the ceremony, which appears in German travel writer Johann George Kohl's 1859 travel memoir, Kichigami, Wanderings Round Lake Superior. Back in 1855, Kohl met a French-Canadian voyageur on the southern shores of Lake Superior, who claimed to have interrogated an Ojibwe ex-shaman on his deathbed. Knowing that the dying man had long since converted to Christianity, and would not dare tell a lie, so near to his impending appointment with his maker, he hoped to extract from him the secrets of the shaking tent. The elder assured him that the ritual was genuine, and that the spirits truly entered the tent during the ceremony. I heard their voices, he said. 
The top of the lodge was full of them, and before me the sky and wide lands lay expanded. I asked Nicole if she witnessed anything similar during the shaking tent ceremony she attended. This is what she told me. Yeah, yeah. They were actually outside the tent, and you saw I saw lights going like in front of me, like. Whew. So I guess people would call them orbs. A speck of light that just kind of, and it wasn't like dust. It was. You could not see in front of your face, downstairs. You cannot see. So there's you. you you can't see, you can't see your hand, you can't see a shadow, nothing, nothing. Yeah, it was in the basement. So we could not see anything. But I certainly saw things that we were from. <laughs> it was quite, um, there, there's nothing else to kind of describe that, really. Yeah. The term orb, or spirit orbs as they are often called, may be familiar to viewers who enjoy watching documentaries and TV shows on paranormal phenomena. Most publicly broadcasted programs represent spirit orbs as small globes of white, grey or blue light, which are not typically visible to the naked eye, but which appear on digital and film photographs and video recordings taken at supposedly haunted locations. Some paranormal investigators believe these anomalies to be visual manifestations of souls of the deceased, bound to our earthly plane. Others have made convincing cases that they are nothing more than particles of dust, or tiny insects, interposed between the camera lens and the object on which the camera is focused, apparently surrounded by a halo of light on account of technological limitations, or perhaps optical illusions produced by interactions between light sources and camera lenses. Whatever the nature of these photographic and videographic anomalies, the popular conception of the spirit orb appears to be related to a truly baffling phenomenon for which no rational explanations readily present themselves. Every once in a while, visitors to supposedly haunted locations, witnesses of out-of-body experiences, those present at the deathbeds of their loved ones, and participants in necromantic rituals like the shaking tent ceremony, report seeing small floating balls of light which do not appear to derive from any external light sources. The behavior of these lights, and the circumstances in which they appear, have led some to suspect that they are disembodied souls, manifest in a form perceptible to the human eye. One interesting description of what is perhaps best described as a spirit light appeared in the February 1953 issue of the magazine Fate, in an article written by Carrie F. Fugit of La Grande, Oregon. Thirteen years ago, Fugit began, I witnessed an occurrence so fantastic that it has haunted me ever since. If I alone had seen that eerie phenomenon, I might have doubted my own eyes, and attributed it to a hallucination, but two of my sisters saw it with me. The incident took place at about 4 o'clock p.m., as my mother lay dying. She called to us during one of her intervals of consciousness, and said it was growing dark. One of my sisters turned on the light, a single bulb almost directly over my mother's bed, and when she had quieted again, we turned it off and intended going out to let her rest. As the bulb went dark, three small balls of light appeared in the room. They were colored like bubbles, and they hovered over my mother for a few seconds, then vanished through the open window. These little lights made a very faint sound, like the pop of a bubble bursting. Except for a grasp from my second sister, we all stood frozen and speechless, awed by what we had seen. Fugit went on to explain that neither she nor any of her family members were spiritualists, and that no one in the room at that time had expected to see anything unusual. Another fate article, echoing the concept of spirit lights, appeared in the August 1961 issue of that publication. The author, Mr. Camille Bissonnette of Montebello, California, was a French-Canadian by birth, whose father, Pierre, spent his entire life farming near the small rural community of Saint-Pierre-Baptiste in Megantic County, Quebec. Pierre never received any formal education and remained illiterate all his life. When he was about 20 years old, Pierre went to help a neighboring farmer with his harvesting. 
During this operation, he worked side by side with a drifter whom the farmer had hired. After each long day of work, Pierre and the drifter retired to the farmer's barn and bunked down in the hayloft. One especially warm night, Pierre heard the drifter arise from the hay, climb down the ladder, and head outside. When he failed to return after some time, Pierre became worried and went to look for him. It was a starry night, he told his son. Having looked around here and there, I finally saw a dark form lying flat on the ground. I advanced cautiously. It was the drifter. He seemed asleep, but when I bent over him, I noticed that if his breathing was regular, it was hardly audible. I did not get alarmed, as some people sleep that lightly. As I was staying still, above him, undecided what I should do, waking him up or going back to the loft alone, I saw a tiny light, a kind of firefly light, hovering over his head, then coming down on his forehead, into which it seemed to disappear. At that moment, the drifter opened his eyes and saw me. I explained the cause of my presence by his side, but when I mentioned the firefly which had waked him up, he jumped on his feet and gripped my shoulder. Please, Pierre, promise me you will never reveal to anyone what you saw tonight. Most of all, never talk about what you called a firefly. Why? I asked. Because nobody will believe you. They'll think you're crazy. I cannot understand, I said. I cannot explain, Pierre. The words will be too deep for you. You would think I am insane. I am only a passerby in this country. I came from a very long distance, in fact from all around the world, where I have seen and learned of strange things. What you have witnessed tonight is one of them. Before I leave for other parts, if I ever lay down again under the stars, and if you happen to see me, please do not touch me and do not talk to me. Rest assured that I will not be dead. I could not get an explanation at all out of this strange man, who left two days later, and I never saw him again. Considering the testimonies of Nicole Barker, Carrie Fugit, and historical witnesses of the shaking tent ceremony, it is tempting to suppose that the firefly Pierre saw on that warm summer night was the drifter's soul floating outside his body, affording the temporary laborer some sort of out-of-body experience. Are disembodied human souls really visible to the naked eye, appearing to us as tiny lights, mysterious bubbles, or floating orbs? Have you ever seen a spirit orb? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below.